I'd like to call today's uh, hearing on the uh, House Judiciary Finance Policy Committee to order. And first up on the agenda, we have uh, Bill, uh, Representative Hillstrom, with uh, Senate File 685. Representative Hillstrom, would you like to move your bill before the committee? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. As soon as we have a quorum, I'll move it. But if we could have our testifiers go through the bill, um, and we'll actually go through it as if the amendment's been adopted. That way it'll save time so we can get on to other bills as well. Um, Mr. Chair, there is a DE-1 amendment uh, in the folks' packet. Um, this, I believe, takes care of any um, of the controversy surrounding um, this bill, and I think it will allow us to move forward. Um, I'd just like to turn it over to my testifiers so they can uh, walk through the provisions. Very good. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members, Matt Burdick with NAMI Minnesota, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And the bill you have before you today is actually a slightly modified version of a bill that this committee heard last session. And it deals with the Rule 2001 process, which is um, competency to stand trial. And what this bill is trying to address is for people that have very serious mental health issues, trying to expedite this process, especially when people are in jail, so that they do not have to languish in jail instead of receiving the treatment they need. So what this is doing is, during circumstances when all parties agree, that is prosecution and defense, allows for simultaneous competency examinations and civil commitment examinations. The way the process works currently um, is that someone is identified as potentially not competent to stand trial. They are then examined to see if that is indeed the case. If that is the case, then civil commitment proceedings begin automatically. And there can at times be long gaps between when those two processes take place, at which point the person is sitting in jail and not receiving the mental health treatment they would need to be able to participate meaningfully in their defense as well as just kind of get on with their lives. So what this bill would do, and this is um, designed to address any stakeholder concerns, is saying when the prosecution and defense both agree that this is appropriate, that we can do the competency exam and the civil commitment examination at the same time to see that this person, if they are indeed not competent and they do indeed meet the commitment standard, that they can get out of jail and begin receiving the mental health treatment they need. And it also allows for the appointment of counsel on the civil commitment piece, which was one of the outstanding controversies from last session, is that currently you are not entitled to, comp to counsel necessarily for the competency portion, but you are for the commitment portion. So if we're combining them, we want to make sure that someone is adequately represented in any um, subsequent civil commitment proceedings. But really, the main idea behind this bill is making sure that people that have very serious mental illnesses who are in our jails are not there and that they're getting the help that they need instead. And so we have some testifiers who can talk about how this works in the real world. Thank you, Mr. Burdick. Hey, Mr. Chair, members, uh, thank you very much for having me this afternoon. My name is Rich Stanick. I'm the sheriff in Hennepin County. I am here uh, proudly supporting well, what I call Senate File 685, but it says SH. What does SH stand for? It's <laughs> Oh, all right. Uh, well, look, I'll keep my sh comments uh, fairly brief since it's already passed through the, uh, the Senate last year. Uh, in fact, I testified on this committee last year before the, uh, the Senate and uh, okay. one of the House. Uh, I appreciate uh, Representative Hillstrom for bringing this bill forward. This will help us uh, keep moving the issue of mental health and what we can do as uh, public policymakers across the state to get this done. In Hennepin County Sheriff's Office, we've been focusing a lot of time and effort over the last couple of years on reviewing issues of mental illness in our criminal justice system. Uh, as Sheriff of Hennepin County, I'm responsible for the operation of the largest jail in Minnesota, the Hennepin County Public Safety Facility. Every year we book anywhere from 36 to 40,000 inmates through the front door. An estimated, conservative estimate, of 25 to 30 percent of them suffer from mental illness. And often our jail staff must operate as frontline mental health workers, and I can tell you, Mr. Chair, members, it is a challenge for them. Uh, people who suffer from mental illness require far more resources than the average inmate. And for instance, the risk of suicide amongst our mentally ill inmates is far higher than those among the uh, average population. The Sheriff's Office won a national award for our mental health training program and our detention staff, but it doesn't stop there. Now, even with the best practices in place, we know that a jail is not the best place for someone 
who suffers from treated or untreated mental illness. Instead, they should be receiving psychiatric treatment in a more appropriate setting, such as a state psychiatric facility. But it's been taking too long to get them there. Those with mental illness are spending too much time in our jail facility, both in Hennepin County and the other counties across our state. In 2012, we had approximately 30 inmates committed to the custody of the Department of Human Services. They were determined to be mentally ill and a danger to themselves and or others. During this last legislative session, Representative Hillstrom, along with her colleagues in the Senate, led the efforts to pass a law requiring that these inmates be transferred to a mental health facility within 48 hours after the issuance of a commitment and transfer order. That's a good thing. This new law has made a significant difference in the amount of time these individuals are waiting in our jail, and that was one uh, important solution, but not the only one. Senate File 685, Mr. Chair and members, offers another solution by speeding up the civil commitment and incompetency evaluations in cases where all parties agree. Now let me provide just one quick example to you and the committee members, if I may. In one case in Hennepin County, it took 15 months from the date of the arrest to the date the inmate was transferred to St. Peter's for an inpatient treatment. Now John Doe was arrested and booked in the Hennepin <coughs> County Jail back in April of 2010. He was charged with five different felonies, including attempted murder in the first degree. Almost a year later, in March of 2011, he was determined to be incompetent to stand trial due to mental illness. Now, he then waited in jail for another three months for further psychological evaluations and hearings until in June of 2011, he was committed to the custody of the Department of Human Services as mentally ill and dangerous and transferred to St. Peter. The court's medical expert concluded that the behavior is dangerous when this condition is not treated. And make no mistake, Mr. Chair, members in jail, we do not treat their mental illness. Yet he sat in jail, which is not a mental health treatment facility, for almost 15 months for the whole process to work before he was placed in appropriate treatment. Because of the jail environment, many of these inmates find their mental health conditions actually get worse. Those with mental illness should not languish in our jails for weeks and even months waiting for the proper care. Look, Mr. Chair, members, we're, uh, you know, we're working to find a way to make this a quicker process. I think Senate File 685 does do just that by combining the incompetency and civil commitment evaluations. This will ensure people who need mental health are getting mental health treatment and not languishing in jail for long periods of time. Now, we realize that Senate File 685 is not the uh, silver bullet solution, and none of them are, but Combined with what you've already adopted last year and ongoing efforts by Representative Hillstrom, Representative Hortman, and others to improve the system, we'll continue to move forward on these important public policy issues statewide. And I appreciate the time you gave me this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you, Sheriff Stanek. And seeing we do have a quorum, I will officially call the meeting to order. Uh, Representative Hillstrom, would you also like to officially move Senate File 685 before the committee? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. I don't, where does it go next? Anywhere? I would move that uh, Senate File 685 uh, go to the General Register, and I'd like to move the DE1 to get the bill in the shape I would like it. Thank you. Um, did you want to explain the DE amendment, or just to get it in the shape, the, to get the bill in the shape? You okay? Questions on the amendment from members? Seeing none. All in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 All opposed. The motion prevails, and the amendment is adopted. I believe that's the end of the testimony. Basically, members, what the um, bill now does is it says that you can do the civil commitment process and the review for competency at the same time when both the prosecution and the defense agrees, and it has a more timely appointment of the um, lawyer. And that's, I have nothing else, Mr. Chair. Questions from members? Is there anyone in the audience? Seeing none, is there anybody from the audience who would like to testify on the bill? Seeing none, Representative Hillstrom, would you like to renew your motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I would uh, move that Senate File 685 be re-referred to the General Register. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The motion prevails, and the bill is referred to the General Register. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Member.
Representative Cornish moves that House File 1585 be re-referred to the General Register. And Representative Cornish, I believe that you have a an amendment to get the bill in the shape that you would like it. Yes, Madam Chair, if I could move the A2 amendment. A2 or A3? I believe I have the A3, A3? amendment. Yeah. A3. Uh, Representative Cornish moves the A3 amendment to get the bill in the shape the author would like it. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Representative Cornish. Well, Madam Chair, this is a bill that uh, House File 1585 to uh, prohibit somebody from filing a fraudulent lien, and it's been on the books for some time, but this would uh, change the bill to read uh, both a police officer or a chief of police because of that performance of the person's performance of official duties and retaliation of fraudulent lien. Uh, then last year, I don't think there was any controversy. This year, it went uh, right through the Public Safety Committee and now is here. And if I could introduce uh, Major Ken Reed from the St. Paul Police Department as a testifier. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. My name is Ken Reed, Commander with the St. Paul Police Department. I'm here today for the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association in, so in support of 1585. Based upon uh, an increasing body of information, we're recommending that the protections that were afforded uh, to sheriff officials uh, involving sales of real property be expanded to all, include all of their duties and also to cover official duties for public officials, including police officers, police chiefs, corrections officials, and that they be given that same felony level protection. Several years ago, the mortgage crisis put the uh, focus of sovereign extremists and other creative criminals on sheriff's departments. However, state and local officers and government workers of all jurisdictional types, being the most visible symbol of government authority, are also the target of retaliatory fraudulent liens and, and encumbrances against their personal property for simply doing their duties, for conducting traffic enforcement, for responding to calls for service, going about their duties in our law enforcement facilities, jails, and courtrooms. Groups and individuals who adhere to the philosophy that the government is illegitimate and has no authority over them, that they are in fact uh, consider themselves sovereign nations under themselves, are active in all 50 states and Canada, including here in Minnesota. They may also believe that the U.S. Federal Reserve is Ill illegitimate, as is, as is the Department of Treasury. The beliefs themselves are not illegal, but the activities that they conduct, uh, that they target, our public officials is. Some of the behaviors in include violence, but most commonly is a set of tactics that you've all heard referred to as paper terrorism, in which these disaffected criminals use fraudulent legal filings and encumbrances to harass, intimidate, and retaliate against public officials. For example, these extremists may illegally file an IRS Form 1099 against an officer or an official, uh, claiming that they made large amounts of income in the belief that such a filing will cause the IRS to audit the individual. Public employees targeted by sovereign extremists often don't know that they were targeted until they go to sell their home or refinance their mortgage and suddenly they're faced with clearing up a bogus multi-million dollar or higher lien against their property. In Minnesota, police and other government officials in Crow Wing, Otter Tail County, Baxter, Lionel Lakes, Coon Rapids, Burnsville, Grand Rapids, Pequot Lakes, and per Perham have also had to deal with sovereign extremists and their bogus paperwork. We at the St. Paul Police Department undertook a multi-year intensive investigation into a couple who used fraudulent financial filings against law enforcement and other public officials to retaliate for the foreclosure of their home. Throughout that investigation, and even now, our investigators and the prosecutor handling the case are rightly worried that they and their assets will face similar retaliation, negatively affecting the personal lives at great cost. They have to regularly check at their local recorder's office and also check their credit history in order to be alerted to any financial retaliations. Two persons were convicted in this case, and they now continue their behavior by retaliating in the same manner against Department of Corrections officials. And you'll hear a little bit more, I think, after this. These actions are disheartening and disruptive to the affected individuals and their families. It can take countless hours of work to undo the damage caused by the false filings 
and it may take months or years to restore credit rating. As exposure to this problem has mounted, several states, most recently Georgia and North Carolina, have enacted legislation or changed statutes to protect their government employees. This is also true on the federal level. Title 18 United States Code Section 1521 made it a 10 year felony to file uh, in any publicly available record a false lien or encumbrance against a government employee. This covers all the US government employees, by the way. I'm asking Minnesota to make sure that our public employees are protected from these types of baseless and hugely disruptive bogus paperwork filings so they may go about doing their jobs with a greater sense of security about their personal situations. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from members? Uh, Representative Moline. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, my question is either for Representative Cornish or maybe for Council. I was just wondering if we could get a definition of what public officer is in 609.415. Ms. Perius? Uh, Madam Chair and members, public officer includes executive or administrative officers of the state, county, municipality, or other political subdivision, a legislative member or governing board member of a political subdivision, a judicial officer, a hearing officer, or a law enforcement officer. Okay, thank you. Other questions from members? Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to testify for or against this bill? Seeing none, Representative Cornish. Oh, here's somebody. Come on to the table. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and go ahead. Chair Hilster, my name is Kiri Gerlicher. I'm with the Minnesota Department of Corrections and I'm the director of the law enforcement agency. I'd just like to take a moment, first of all, to thank you for your time to listen to this bill and to concur with Commander Reed. Um, the Department of Corrections for many years has had ongoing investigations with offenders who have come in and filed false liens against employees of the Department of Corrections. Currently, in the last seven months, we've had two wardens who have had liens put on their homes. Um, it was a spin-off of the case that St. Paul Police Department did. Um, and the liens were filed within 30 days of their um, admission to the Department of Corrections. Um, those liens have been unable to be removed at this time. It's a long and laborious process. I have a warden who wants to buy a car in about eight weeks and is hoping she can get a loan and quite frankly is feeling that she is going to have issues because of this lien on her home. So again, um, Welcome to the committee. I would State your name like for the record and go ahead. Reed, sure, that that this is, is an ongoing issue, issue with the law enforcement department and elected, elected officials throughout the state um, and it would make sense to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from members? Anyone else in the audience wanting to testify on the bill? Seeing none, Representative Cornish renews his motion that House File 1585 as amended be sent to the General Register. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Cornish. Welcome to the committee, Representative Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Allen, the chair will move that House File 1082 be um, re-referred to the Committee on Public Safety, Policy, and Finance. And Representative Allen, it's my understanding that you have an author's amendment. Yes, Madam Chair. So the chair would move the author's amendment as A14 to get the bill in the shape the author would like it. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Representative Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Thank you for hearing this bill. Uh, many of you are, are co-authors, so I'm going to refresh your memory what this bill is. Um, House File 1082 uh, requires an admission of guilt or a conviction for a drug-related crime in criminal court as a prerequisite to losing property through forfeiture in civil court. No one acqu no, acquitted of a crime should lose his property through civil forfeiture. And I think this is part where everybody has agreement on and, and, uh, and I'll just give you a little bit of the background. Um, in forfeiture cases in civil court, under current state law, uh, a criminal conviction in, a conviction in criminal court is required for some crimes. And that includes prostitution, fleeing a police officer, DWI, and other designated offenses. Uh, this means that to show that the crime occurred for the purpose of forfeiture in civil court, state law requires the conviction from the criminal trial be introduced into evidence. This is uh, basically this is seven points that, that I'll mention. It's good public policy. This is the uh, law. Number one, and it's a good thing. The the, state will what we're concerned about here is the exception. 
In forfeitures involving an underlying drug crime, however, the burden of proof is different. In those forfeiture cases, the burden is on the property owner to prove in civil court the seized property, such as cash and vehicles, is not associated with controlled substance. Nothing that happens in the criminal court matters. What this bill does is it ends that exception. It makes a conviction in criminal court a prerequisite for all civil forfeitures. And this was this part here, the um, in other uh, types of proceedings was what we worked out with the county. Um, and so in addition to convictions, the bill now allows for other types of showing of guilt in drug related cases, including the property owner suspect agreeing to a diversion or having the judge stay his criminal sentence. And we also, it includes an admission of guilt as well. And I want to just, just uh, stress what four things that this bill does not do. This bill keeps the two-track system of criminal prosecution in criminal court and civil forfeiture in civil court. This bill does not change the administrative process that prosecutors mostly use, which accounts for 97% of forfeitures for, of abandoned property. And uh, the testifier can explain a little uh, more in detail about that, what the significance of that. Um, this bill does not change the work of police officers, only the work of prosecutors. And this bill does not change Minnesota's innocent owner laws. Um, House File 1082 is, is widely supported. Um, the 10 men, members of this committee are co-authors. And uh, there's 25 total co-authors and the Minnesota County Attorneys Association agrees to the language. Uh, the Minnesota Criminal Defense Lawyers Association, the ACLU, Institute for Justice, Second Chance Coalition all support this bill. And I'll can turn it over to the testifier to give you more detail or answer any questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and go ahead. Uh, Madam Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Lee McGrath. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota chapter of the Institute for Justice. I've uh, had the pleasure of working with you, Madam Chairman, as well as Representative uh, Allen uh, on this bill. She's described it well. I, be, I stand for any, qu I, we support it at the Institute for Justice and I worked closely with the ACLU and the Minnesota Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. We've covered the political spectrum in support of this bill and I'm uh, happy that you're hearing it. I thank you and I stand for any questions that members might have about this important piece of legislation. Any questions from members? Representative Moline. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and to the author, Mr. McGrath. Can you just explain for me how the, is the property just returned automatically or is there a hearing and who has the burden of proof at the hearing? If you could just explain how the property is returned once charges are dismissed or the person is acquitted. Mr. McGrath. Um, uh, Madam Chairman, Representative Moline, if the person is acquitted, or charges are dropped in the criminal process, the property is returned uh, within the normal processing days. If, so that is st step one. There is a requirement that the person be first convicted, admit to some level of guilt, uh, uh, have a stay of execution, uh, go through a diversion program. If one of those four things happen, that is introduced into evidence over on the civil case, McGrath versus 2008 Chevrolet and Pala. And in that case, uh, the burden is on now under this bill on the government to prove that the Chevrolet and Pala was a instrument, or if there were cash, a proceeds of the crime. Representative Molly. Thank you. Representative Paymer, did you have a question? Okay. Questions from members? Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to testify for or against this bill? Seeing none, the chair renews her motion that House File 1082, as amended, be a re referred to the Committee on Public Safety, Finance, and Policy. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Thank you. Allen. Representative Portman. Representative Hortman moves that House File 2660 be referred to the General Register. Representative Hortman, it's my understanding that you have the A1 amendment to get the bill in the shape you would like it? 
Yes, ma'am. Representative Hortman moves the A1 amendment to get the bill in the shape she would like it. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Representative Hortman. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Members, this uh, bill relates to the Informa Papyrus statute. Informa Papyrus refers to a status that litigants uh, get in the court. Uh, lawyers, we refer to it as IFP, and it means your client's very poor. And this just makes a few changes. And with me is Melinda Hogdahl to explain the changes. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, and Melinda Hugdahl from Legal Aid. Um, this is a good little unsession bill that I've spoken with many of you about. Um, in 2011, the legislature amended the statute to kind of create a, a more tiered system of, of civil filing fees. And so there's categorical eligibility, which was not changed in 2011. What was created was uh, a basis above that where you couldn't pay the full fee, but you could pay a partial fee. And then if your circumstances changed, the court could order you to pay reimbursement. The um, issue that we found is because those two concepts were put together in one sentence um, in existing law, that there's been just a little bit of inconsistency out there on how it's being applied in the real world. So all we are doing is pulling those provisions apart so that it's uh, clear what the intent of the bill is and what the statute was. Um, Senator Limmer, who was involved in the Senate in this, is a co-author on the bill there as well, so it's, it's uh, been non-controversial. So it clarifies the beginning of an action. The court can order a reduced filing fee for people who are above the categorical eligibility but can't afford the full fee, and that's lines 1.22 to 2.2. Uh, and clarifies that if you're no longer categorically eligible or you reduced, received a reduced fee and later you could pay more, the court can do that as reimbursement. So again, it's not changing the intent. The other piece we did is the term public assistance has been in the IFP statute uh, since 1989 but never been defined. So while we were at it, we just cross-referenced to the garnishment statute and all those are means-tested programs. And the intent of that categorical eligibility is that someone else is already screening you to make sure you're low income so the court can rely on that. And it's a judicial time saver and has been over time. So it's just because there's never been a definition, uh, just creating a cross-reference to garnishment. But they're all means-tested programs under that cross-reference provision. Questions from members? And in, anyone in the audience wishing to testify for or against this bill? Seeing none, members, I just want to let you know that we did, in fact, check with the courts to see if there would be a fiscal note, um, and we were told that, uh, I'll, I'll let Mr. Walls actually tell you what he was told. Mr. Walls. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I had a conversation with the courts, a brief conversation with the courts on this, and was told that it was not substantial enough for a fiscal note. All right. With that, Representative Hort Hortman renews her motion that House File 2660, as amended, be sent to the General Register. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Thank you. Hortman. Thank you. Is Representative Atkins here? Representative Atkins, I think you have House File 2482 first. Everything you'd like to hear, Madam Chair. I think this is the shorter one, Representative Atkins. I believe this is to go to the General Register, Representative Atkins. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So I would move that House File 2482 uh, be sent to the General Register. Representative Atkins, welcome to the committee. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 2482 is a simple bill. It recognizes that we now have electronic forms of gaming. Uh, and this uh, just updates Minnesota statutes uh, to recognize that. Essentially saying don't mess with these games and don't take them out the door. Uh, that's the, uh, the element of the bill. There is uh, uh, no personal data maintained in or on these devices, so that's not a concern uh, like it might be with other uh, computers or system uh, related bills. Uh, the bill is supported by all. In fact, I wrote it down uh, because everybody in the charitable gaming industry supports the bill from the charities, the bar owners, the vendors, uh, and our uh, regulatory counterparts, public safety. Um, we've, uh, uh, with that, Madam Chair, uh, I do have uh, Mr. Barrett from the Gaming Con Gambling Control Board if there are questions, uh, but I think that's a pretty adequate description of what the bill does. Questions from members? Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify for or against this bill? 
Seeing none, the chair renews the motion that House File 2482 uh, be sent to the general register. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Adkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Adkins, I believe your final bill is the last uh, item on the agenda. So we are done here at uh, 345. So, um, Representative Adkins, if you keep um, that in mind as you uh, present the final bill. I'm Representative. <laughs> you want me to fill? No. An hour's worth of time, Madam Chair? No, Representative Adkins, I just, in case there, there, there appears to be a bunch of amendments, and in case it's controversial, I just wanted to make sure that you uh, understood the time limitation we had here. Representative Adkins. And thank you, Madam Chair. The, my understanding is that most of the amendments are coming from members, um, and frankly, I don't uh, object uh, to the amendments. There is one author's amendment, uh, Madam Chair, at the A2, which would just put the bill in the shape that I'd like to to move it forward. And if it's your uh, your desire, we could put that one on. Um, it's a minor change that just recognizes that there is one other company that does the same sort of work as uh, as two of the companies that are listed in the bill. Uh, and literally, it's just an oversight. We meant to, I think, uh, the uh, proponents of the bill are just fine with have, adding on uh, uh, the gold standard uh, drug database in addition to the two other databases that are already listed in the bill. All right, well, the chair will move that House File 3073 going to the Civil Law Committee, um, be, and then I would move the A2 amendment to get the bill in the shape the author would like it. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Representative Adkins. And thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be very brief. Uh, this is the insurance fraud or insurance anti-fraud bill. Uh, a number of parties brought it to me. Uh, I give a lot of credit to uh, Senators Gazelka, Jensen, and Metzen, uh, who put together a task force over the summer to try to uh, attack uh, issues of fraud. Uh, there are folks that can talk to you about the, uh, the depth and breadth of that issue here in Minnesota. Uh, but the aim was to uh, to address and, and do our best to prevent uh, fraud from taking place uh, in Minnesota. There are some additional elements uh, to that. I want to focus, obviously, Madam Chair, on the elements that are before this committee. Uh, but there's also some updates to Minnesota's no-fault law. For example, um, I think it's been somewhere in the neighborhood of four decades since the weekly wage loss benefit was updated. Currently, it's still $250 a week, uh, which is about eight-something an hour. Uh, it would increase it to $500 a week. The cap would still remain at $20,000. So the insurance industry won't, uh, uh, won't be talking about that it will increase people's rates. It's just an update to recognize that uh, people are making more money than they were 40 years ago. Uh, there's an increase, for example, to the funeral benefit. Uh, currently it's $2,000. Uh, honestly, I don't know if you can even get a pine box uh, funeral under the uh, auto benefit that's currently available. So again, with the insurance industry's blessing that uh, is being moved to 5,000. Again, not a, not a significant um, bump, but those are some examples of some updates. Nothing in the bill has proven to be too terribly controversial. Uh, there are some amendments I know that members have, uh, and even among the, the amendments, I don't think that we're going to find a great deal of, of controversy, more so in terms of uh, clarification. Uh, there was a provision, for example, uh, relative to uh, sometimes what people will have, they have a auto claim where they, uh, uh, they find out afterwards that family members, um, they think that family members are covered under their coverage and they found out that they're not. Uh, so there was an amendment that went on in the last committee that says that you can't have those sorts of, uh, they're called drop down provisions that would exclude your own family members from being covered. Uh, Representative Anderson raised a good question about that uh, and, you know, how far and wide does that spread in, within a family? So I think Representative Hortman has an amendment that sort of captures uh, and puts some parameters around that a little bit. Uh, but Madam Chair, that's essentially what the, what the bill does. Um, and I know that there's also a summary in your, in your packets, but with that, and in light of the fact that you pointed out to me what time it is, uh, I would be happy to take testifiers, or if you'd like to go directly into the amendments, that's fine with me as well. I think we'd like to go to the amendments and then go to testifiers, if that's okay. Representative Hortman. Uh, Madam Chair, the amendment that Representative Atkins just referred to is the A140986 amendment. Representative Hortman. It deletes an or 
and it inserts a that. And by, by making those changes on page four, line two, it addresses the question that Representative Anderson raised in the Commerce Committee about uh, whether a resident household member, member has to be related by blood or marriage. So it's a clarifying amendment. Questions from members? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Um, Madam Chair, I have one more if you want to get rid of me. For Representative the, Hortman. Um, the A140985, uh, what it does is it deletes a 60 and inserts a 90, and by doing that it adds 30 days to the time for submission of medical bills, and it conforms to a change that was made in the Senate. Questions from members? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Um, members, I actually have the uh, next two amendments. The um, A3 amendment um, is a whistleblower provision. Um, members, this just makes it so that uh, when someone tells, they have some protections. Um, I believe that the uh, author is okay with this amendment. And Representative Atkins. Madam Chair, I, I am the only uh, item that I, and it's I guess it would be for civil law, is in the section on page 2 towards the bottom. There's some discussion of immunity and defamation and issues, I guess, that are civil law related that I, I just want to make certain that uh, that if somebody does something wrong, that there's still an ability to, to address or redress that wrong. But absolutely, I support uh, a whistleblower the whistleblower language that you propose. Questions from members? Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, this uh, this amendment is really a, a commerce-related amendment. I don't know that it uh, applies to the content or um, the uh, the area that really uh, is within the purview of this committee. So um, I'm um, somewhat hesitant to support a, a commerce-related amendment and wonder if it is applied to the bill, if, if the bill then would need to go to Commerce uh, for their discussion. Uh, Representative uh, Cornish, um, you can see that, oh, sorry, sorry, Representative Draskowski, sorry. Um, you will see that on page two, there actually is a section um, on line 2.2 where it talks about if presented in court. Um, there's also some stuff that this is all talking about. Um, Courts, so it is appropriate for this committee to take on that, and whether or not it has to go back to the Commerce Committee. He's the Commerce Chair, and they has a it has a fiscal note that uh, costs Commerce some money. So I would anticipate that he has to address that in Commerce as well. So civil law sections will uh, be addressed in Representative um, Lesh's committee as well. But uh, that's the reason I brought it here, because otherwise we put it on in Lesh's committee. They have to come back here anyways. Representative Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Atkins, is this going to go back to your committee with this amendment on it then? And has the Insurance Federation had a chance to vet this and talk with you about it? Representative Atkins. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Driscoll. My understanding from the proponents who have uh, uh, prepared the amendment is that they've checked with the various uh, stakeholders uh, and learned that uh, there is no objection. And I, those uh, folks that uh, uh, might be interested in it uh, are not shy uh, people so my guess is if they had a big problem they'd come running down here and sit next to me and say they had a problem uh, in terms of the uh, the whistleblower element uh, commerce does have a role in that the commerce uh, committee does but honestly most of that jurisdiction lies with this this committee certainly there's it's like a Venn diagram um, there's some crossover jurisdiction so I will look to see if for example representative Hoppy who's the lead on the committee if he comes to me and says I've got some serious issues with this that would be meaningful to me uh, in terms of potentially bringing it back uh, if need be or if or if the proponents or opponents were to say the same thing that would be meaningful as well Fine up. thank you uh, representative Atkins and yeah if we could hear from mr. Johnson I think that might be welcome good. to the committee state your name for the record and go ahead madam chair and committee members Bob Johnson Insurance Federation of Minnesota uh, just briefly this language was it's not my proposal it was not put together by the insurance industry but uh, the proponents have run this by us as uh, representative Atkins has indicated and we don't have objections today we're still kind of sorting through there might be some of the details as representative Atkins indicated but in terms of you know the the, the concept and the proposal uh, I think whistleblowing laws can be a tool 
tool to actually help fight fraud. So in that sense, it actually kind of fits within the umbrella of the bill. But I guess I just want to state that today, that there's, there may be details that are yet to be worked on because this isn't an area of expertise that I have in insurance. So I'm reaching out to others to uh, help me sort through that. And uh, Representative Dreskowski, we're, we're open to continue the discussion. Thank you, Madam Chair. All those, welcome to the, come on to the table. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Kevin Goodno. I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Chiropractors Association. Uh, this isn't our piece of legislation either. We do have some concerns about it. We need to take a closer look at it. It appears that it's, it provides a mechanism where the insurance company can basically go out and pay providers to provide information on potentially competitors or other folks and then provides um, additional immunities to those people who are being paid, those people providing the information from a certain type of recourse if that information may be incorrect or may be, be seen to be in violation of the laws otherwise. And so we do have some concerns about it. We're willing to look at it and work with the authors um, and the proponents of the legislation, but we weren't aware of this until it was posted. So, thank you. So all those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion prevails. And the final one is the A140984 amendment. And members, this is this is also um, my amendment. And this allows for post-trial relief for breach of an insurer's code of conduct in handling claims under Minnesota statute 604.18. The claim for taxable costs is based on, in part, the, um, the amount actually awarded by the court in a jury. And some insurance companies are making motions to request that the breach of insurance code of conduct must be made before re resolution of the underlying claims, which is directly in conflict with the statute. So um, hours of court time have been wasted on these motions, and um, they end up being merit meritless efforts. So the A140984 amendment makes it clear that the relief for taxable costs must be made post-trial and that discovery on this relief is available after the decision is made. So Representative Atkins, do you have an, uh, an opinion on that amendment? Um, Atkins. Madam Chair, it uh, sounds like a sound amendment to me. Questions from members? Madam Chair. Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it, it appears that uh, this is... Uh, the full language included in House File 2964, and um, I have a sense, Madam Chair, that we are assembling a garbage bill here, and um, I, I don't, I, I don't know that that's the uh, that's the best uh, way to make legislation here today. Um, so I, again, this is this is a bill that probably should be heard in other committees. I have or an amendment, I guess, today rather than a bill, um, and I wonder. Um, I wonder if it's been help, heard elsewhere at this point. And Representative Dreskowski, it's going to civil law next, so it will be heard in other committees. And that's that's where it, uh, these are civil cases, so it's heard in the courts, and then it's going to be heard in civil law next. Thank you, and I see that Commerce did, uh, well, they did not hear it. So does Commerce expect to hear this bill with this new Commerce-related amendment on it? Representative Atkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Dreskowski. Again, I, I take input from people like Representative Hoppe and others. This one, though, um, falls squarely within the jurisdiction of this committee in civil law, and much less so in uh, in commerce, though commerce ar arguably has uh, some jurisdiction as well. But I would imagine that most of the issues will be fully vetted here and, and primarily also in civil law. Representative Dreskowski. Madam Chair, does Mr. Johnson have something to say about this bill, uh, this bill being amended onto this bill? Come on up. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Dale Thorns Joe. I'm a civil litigator in uh, suburban Minneapolis with the O'Mara, Lear, Wagner, and Cole firm. And for 30 years, I've been a practitioner in the, uh, in the business. Most of that time has been involved with insurance matters and specifically insurance litigation. Uh, I have a fairly unique perspective with the bad faith bill which this amendment will be uh, impacting because I was 
involved in the original efforts back in 2008 in collaboration with Representative Atkins as part of that bill. Uh, I've co-authored uh, Bad Faith uh, Compendiums for the State of Wisconsin for the Defense Research Institute. I have authored the Bad Faith Compendium for the State of Minnesota for the Defense Research Institute. Uh, I started the Insurance Law Committee for the local uh, Minnesota Defense Lawyers Association. However, in spite of that defense orientation, I have represented policyholders as well as insurance carriers on a variety of coverage matters. And I sit here today to emphasize that the comprehensive legislation that was put together in 2008 was structured in a specific fashion to prevent the bad faith claim that is being asserted from driving events involved with or the outcome of the underlying insurance coverage claim. And very frankly, what may look like benign amendments to this statute in fact have a major impact on how bad faith claims would be procedurally handled by the courts. And with all due deference, Madam Chair, I think the description that has been read with the uh, uh, description of the amendments is incorrect because in fact discovery would end up taking place on a bad faith claim during the pendency of an underlying action prior to an amendment for uh, asserting a bad faith claim. And so really it puts the cart before the horse on the entire concept of what the American judicial system is based on, and that is you have to assert a cause of action before you can take discovery on it. The dynamic that I think is trying to be uh, impacted here is if I take discovery as a policyholder against an insurance company, I can attempt to find out if in fact there was bad faith in the handling of my claim. And unfortunately, that's really a backwards concept as well. Critical with this is that the concept of bad faith happens at the time of a claim denial. Claim denial happens prior to litigation itself, and therefore, with the concept of a motion to amend to assert a bad faith claim, the evidence that the plaintiff has or the policyholder has already is in the possession of the policyholder in order to make that motion. So regardless as to whether it may end up being post-trial or as under the current statute during the pendency of the litigation, which actually makes much more sense because you do want to know what the entirety of the claims are that are being asserted in a lawsuit before the matter is resolved. Technically, the amendments on the, on the motions to amend could run up to six years after the end of the underlying action before that motion can be brought. It's, it's kind of this never-ending claim concept with, with the approach that's put together by this amendment. It just doesn't make any rational sense of finality. Uh, it puts the courts in a position of having to pick up cases that have long been resolved. And also, more importantly, it also diverts the court to deal with discovery issues about a bad faith claim when no cause of action for bad faith has been asserted. And so again, it's a cart before the horse dynamic. It runs counter to the original legislative intent of the 2003, uh, 2008 enactment. Uh, there's another concern as well as considering the jury verdict or considering the verdict, uh, which is a third element of the, uh, of the legislation. I'm not quite sure, frankly, what that means. A verdict implies that it's a jury trial and there's no guarantee that any of these issues are resolved by jury trial. Secondly, the verdict, as we all know, is not the basis on which a judgment is entered. There are usually set-offs, there are, are various offsets that can happen, and so when there is an analysis of a claim, it is not an analysis of a verdict that would be looked at by the insurance carrier. It's the analysis of what the ultimate net is going to be. And so to have the court look at a verdict, which might be hundreds of thousands of dollars more than what the actual 
amount might be that the insurance carrier owes, I think is a distraction and a misnomer, and it does not fit within the tightness and preciseness of what this bill was all about. Uh, lastly, Madam Chair, uh, I do have concerns about the fact that the enactment date or the effective date of this amendment is as of the date of uh, a passage. What that will do will affect every pending insurance case, first party insurance case, that is pending in any of the courts, including the appellate courts, and opens up an ability to be able to move to amend on matters that probably are very close to ending and certainly on the appellate phase uh, are nearly complete. And so I have a concern about the procedural dynamics of the effective date as well. Thank you. So members, I just want to make it very clear that um, I pulled some, we have some orders that I pulled together. Um, this one is signed by uh, Judge Phil Carruthers. This uh, cause, having come before the court in joint stipulation to state plaintiff's motion to amend in bad faith claim and supporting memorandum and the parties having conferred and having no objection, it's hereby ordered and judged that the plaintiff motion to stay her motion to amend to add a bad faith claim pursuant to Minnesota Statute 604.18 until such time as the underlying claim is resolved is hereby granted. Another stipulation regarding good faith determination post-trial in American Family Mutual um, uh, Insurance uh, Company lawsuit, whereas the parties have, um, to this cause, have agreed that determination of liability under Minnesota's Insurance Good Faith Act Minnesota Statute 604.18 would be premature prior to a verdict being ordered. That one was signed by um, both attorneys in the matter. I have another one that says joint stipulation to stay plaintiff's motion to amend to add bad faith claims. Um, also in the 4th Judicial District. Comes now the parties hereby stipulate to stay the plaintiff's motion to amend her complaint to add bad faith claims as outlined in the plaintiff's motion to her motion, again, until it's resolved. I can go on and on and on. So it isn't that this isn't done, this actually is done, and I can provide copies um, to the committee of these orders. Mr. Johnson. Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, I'll be brief. Uh, in sharp contrast to the last amendment that I came up to speak on, this amendment has absolutely nothing to do with the Insurance Fraud Reduction Act, Senate File 3073, and would uh, urge the committee to reject. It is a freestanding bill. Uh, it's not been heard this year. Uh, the issues surrounding 604.18, Madam Chair, as you just talked about, were vetted over a two-year period, 2007, 2008, and resulted in an agreement by the parties over a two-year intensive legislative debate to put together the current law, which your amendment amends without any of that debate or discussion or the parties looking at it. So Mr. Thornshaw went through details. I won't repeat any of that. I would just urge the committee, it bears, it has nothing to do with the Insurance Fraud Reduction Act. And just to, in closing, uh, just urge the committee, and I, I recognize that it is the other body, but nine senators spent a half a year working on, through a work group, the insurance fraud work group that I know Chairman Atkins presented at the last, uh, at his committee here, and at least summarized that, unanimously agreed, Senators Dietzik, Barb Goodwin, Susan Kent, and, and uh, Vicki Jensen, with Jensen being a co-chair, and on the Republican side, Senators Gazelka, Limmer, Dames, and Pratt, those eight and Senator Metzen was there, there were nine, unanimously agreed, unanimously agreed on a bill for 2014. Uh, this amendment doesn't fit that, but maybe most importantly, it has nothing to do with insurance fraud. Madam Chair, so I, I just would urge, I don't think it belongs here. Uh, obviously, we're going to vote on it. And I think we have a unique opportunity in 2014 to take a bipartisan, concrete step to help Minnesota consumers who are losing ground to the fraudsters in this state with the cost of their auto and homeowners and umbrella and the cost of goods and services. This committee won't have the opportunity to hear the testimony that Ramsey County Attorney John Choi gave at the Senate Commerce Committee, extensively talking about the report, the recommendations, 
and the benefit, the benefit to consumers to take these steps. So I, I, I know that, Madam Chair, you don't have the time, and there's just a lot and others, law enforcement groups. So I, I think it would be unfortunate uh, if language like this puts in jeopardy at all. Moving forward, consumers are paying a lot of money because of insurance fraud. This is not a left or right or Republican or Democratic issue. I've got materials that from New York, Governor Cuomo, and an aggressive efforts out there from the FBI, from, from states of all stripes are fighting today working with consumer groups, lead consumer groups. The Consumer Federation of America endorses the bill as it was initially Consumer Federation of America. So I'm just giving the members just a little flavor. So this is not an insurance industry project. This is a project that's got leading prosecutors, law enforcement, consumer groups coming together. And a lot of times we don't. And that's fine in other issues where there's a lot of fighting that goes on or disagreements, this is not one of them. So I would just urge the committee, we have a, a unique opportunity, let's help Minnesota consumers. It's costing them easily $1,000 plus a year per household and increased premiums and cost of goods and services. And I just hope the, that we can stay, keep the focus. Uh, the bill as sent, uh, House File uh, 3073 has got important good changes in it that we endorse, we, you know, we've met with the trial lawyers as part of their agreements that I reached with the Minnesota Association of Justice. And Joel Carlson would a agree to that, the sum of which even didn't make it in the bill just because of the process. So I'm just giving the members just a, a, a brief flavor of the background, the development, what's come together, and the unique opportunity we have in 2014 to take a concrete step to help consumers fight a crime that uh, is growing in this state. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Joel Carlson. I'm uh, here on behalf of the Minnesota Association for Justice, and we do support the, uh, this amendment. And I hate to disagree with Mr. Thorns, Joe, but I kind of have to. Um, and I was actively involved, as was. Uh, uh, Representative Atkins on, Atkins on drafting the good faith statute that we have, and you need to know, and this is why this Im amendment is important, is that part of the decision for the court on what damages to award when someone who has breached their duty, which we consider to be a fraud, when they breach their duty to their own insured, is what the verdict or the amount awarded is. And we are spending so much court time now hearing motions that are not ripe because they do not have a verdict and they cannot uh, award damages under the statute because they do not have a verdict. All this amendment says, it doesn't damage our good faith law at all. It strengthens it because it makes clear that this is only a post-trial relief. That's the way the courts have been handling it, as the chair has noted from the decisions that she has um, um, uh, talked about. That's all this amendment does. It doesn't do anything else. And I spent my summer vacation on insurance fraud, too. And one of the things representing consumers that we want people to understand is that when claims are wrongfully delayed and denied, that that's a fraud, too. It isn't just about a provider or someone else who's trying to game the system. There are problems in the insurance industry with consumers being able to get what they're entitled to. This is one lever that they have at their disposal, but it only applies after judgment has been entered, and that's how the court should handle it. This is only about court procedure. It isn't about the underlying claim, and we'd appreciate um, your support. And if there's language that needs to be fixed, whether it needs to say verdict or the amount awarded, happy to address those. But this is the absolute right thing to do for our courts who are spending a needless amount of time on unnecessary motions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Representative Atkins. Madam Chair, I think it's been summed up fairly well. It seems to me, I'm, I know that it's been talked about for 20 minutes or half an hour now, but uh, as I understand what's going on uh, and what judges seem to be doing routinely as well, these motions are being made prematurely. They're taking up hours and hours of court's time only to then be stayed until after trial. Uh, and uh, this just clarifies that. It says that it is, in fact, a post-trial motion, which is when most of the judges prefer to, to be hearing it uh, in any event, and that seems to make sense. So I think, Madam Chair, your amendment makes a great deal of sense and saves the court's uh, time and resources. Further questions from members? 
Representative Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just ask the author, uh, uh, Representative Atkins, why, I mean, this was a bill in front of your committee. It was your bill. You you, you have the gavel on your committee. Why, why here and why now? Representative Atkins. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Driscoll, because Chair Hillstrom offered it here and now. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative, uh, Rep and Representative Atkins. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I'd, I'd urge members to keep the garbage out of the bill and ask for a roll call. All right. Any other questions for members? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll. Uh, Representative Hillstrom? Aye. Representative Moline? Aye. Representative Draskowski? No. Representative Bly? Aye. Representative Cornish? No. Representative Hortman? Aye. Representative Johnson B? No. Representative Johnson S? Aye. Representative Lash? Aye. Representative Lean? Aye. Representative McNamer? Aye. Representative Paymar? Aye. Representative Pugh? No. Representative Scott? No. The motion prevails nine to five. Closing statements, Representative Atkins. Uh, Madam Chair and members, thank you for your time this afternoon. I'd appreciate your support. Mm -hmm. You want to roll call on the bill? Representative Draskowski requests a roll call on the bill. The, ch the chair renews her motion that House File 3073, as amended, uh, be re referred to the Civil Law Committee. The clerk will take the roll. Representative Hillstrom? Aye. Representative Moline? Aye. Representative Draskowski? No. Representative Bly? Aye. Representative Cornish? No. Representative Portman? Aye. Representative Johnson B? No. Representative Johnson S? Yes. Representative Lesh? Aye. Representative Lean? Aye. Representative McNamer? Aye. Representative Paymar? Aye. Representative Pugh? No. Representative Scott? No. The motion prevails nine to five. Thank you, Representative Atkins. Madam Chair and members. Uh, members, I would take a motion to approve the minutes. Uh, Representative Hortman moves the minutes. Any um, issues or corrections? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. With that, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>